This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com. So, I have slides here just because that's what we do here, not because they ha add anything extra to this. Um, a lot of it's going to be me walking you guys through uh, my development environment and showing you guys a couple theme frameworks. Um, so first I want to step back. The think back off of first. Um, I wanted to mention a, a theme that I found recently, not like any of the themes I'm going to show you, uh, but I think does the, the drag and drop functionality like I had never seen before. Um, it is Elegant Themes. Uh, it's based off of the plugin that was mentioned earlier, but it's called the Divi theme. Um, I've been using this to spin up websites in a matter of like an hour or so just for, just for fun. Uh, and they're responsive. They have parallax effects on the, the content if you want to add it. It's very modular. It's the easiest theme I've, I've ever used, uh, which is hard for me because I like making themes from scratch. And this is fun to see like my thing come to life. But now I'm dragging and dropping columns and making it responsive, adding full width lead images with video backgrounds and parallax effects on it just by dragging and dropping stuff around. Um, so. Because my talk is so short, uh, I wanted to jump in and actually show you guys what that looks like. Because this is the uh, extreme opposite of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the themes that don't come with a lot of functionality, the themes that are purposely stripped down to their core so that as a developer, you can kind of jumpstart that first you know, five, six hours worth of setup work, uh, setting, up the, setting, setting up the way that you like. Um, and there's tons of starter themes, or I, I call them developer theme frameworks, out there. Uh, but we'll, we'll get into that. So quickly, just to show you how this stuff works, um, this is a little side project I started doing with a friend of mine. I don't know if he's still here. He had to take off. But uh, this, this was the theme. Um, not bad. It took me three hours to make from scratch. I had no content or anything. Uh, the blog post obviously came later. Um, and here's actually what you're seeing in the back end. So this is, every page is to be built from scratch, everything from the header to the footer. Once you get something like this that you like, you can save that as a, uh, as a template that you can then reuse to make other parts of the site. And Basically, the way it works, you create your giant sections. Within your sections, you create your columns. And within your columns, you add your modules. And some sample modules, like the full width header, for example. Uh, basic things like changing the text color, um, the subheading, uh, let's try a different one, uh, call to action. Some of these have like, effects so that as you're scrolling, the text can keep coming from the right or the left and kind of gently scroll. It just looks really professional and clean. It's the kind of site that I aim to make for most of my clients, ultimately. Um, and it basically follows a lot of really popular design trends right now. So, you know, the parallax responses, that kind of stuff. So, um, if you are looking for the opposite of what I'm about to talk about, that simple drag and drop, very, very easy to use, and spin up really nice looking sites, definitely check out Divi. Elegant themes, I'm pretty sure you pay like $39 and you get access to all of their, his themes that he develops throughout the year. And it's just $39 from there right now. The Delta license is probably more than that, but. Uh, Elegant themes in general, I have a huge fan. I like a lot, a lot of his themes. Uh, and then as I saw him create page builder as a standalone plugin. It's like, cool, that, that's cool, but you know, it depends on the theme. You know, the, as far as like, what it's gonna do and how it's gonna work. And then he came up with this. And this, I'm hoping from here on out, it, it's kind of like this. So. Uh, that's my, my plug for all the themes. I get nothing from that, uh, except for helping you guys out, hopefully. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, the opposite. Um, the, the stripped down frameworks, the bare minimum that you need to get started. When I started doing WordPress theme development, I relied a lot on the default WordPress themes. Unfortunately, this is back when Kubrick was the default WordPress theme. I don't know if you guys remember that, but it's not your ideal uh, website for a professional business. Um, it, it got better from there on out. So 2010, 2012, 2013, 20, those were my starter themes. They're the themes that you probably see 
when you when you first install WordPress, and that's what I would kind of as a developer, you know, piece break apart and you know, take get rid of the style sheet, replace it with my own, and I kind of build up from there as I got used to all the theme functions, all the functionality that I'd want to be in my site. Uh, but with that, you, you still have all the bloat and kind of the, the, the stuff that they put in 2012 more for educational purposes, stuff to just make you aware that this functionality now exists, not necessarily that you need it. Um, there are a lot of good practices in there. So as I moved on, um, I did a lot of the starting from scratch, but I still pulled the pieces from 2012 and 2011 and that kind of stuff. So then I started exploring the world of uh, starter themes. Or like I said, I, I, I like to, I've always called them WordPress developer theme frameworks. Um, the, if you try to Google that, nothing would come up. If you Google starter themes, you'd find a lot of what I'm about to show you today. So um, basically, uh, in a nutshell, uh, a starter theme is a WordPress theme that just jump starts the development process. So it, I'll, I'll get into the nitty gritty of it, but basically uh, it, it gives you a basic basis for your code and file structure. You know, where your functions are organized and all your API calls that you make that won't be in functionality plugins. Where do you put those in the theme that nuts when other developer can find them? So that it makes sense and it doesn't conflict with other potential plugins or other vendors that might be doing things with your WordPress sites. I work at an agency, so a lot of times I'm handing off the WordPress site to a client who has their own internal developers. So I need to make sure that whatever I give them is logical, it makes sense. They can go in and find the pieces that I changed and make it their own in the future. A starter, starter theme should have uh, basic styles and functions. This is extremely minimal, and it, it might not even have those. Uh, one of the themes, some of the themes we're, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you uh, really don't have much for styles, and that's the appeal. Um, one of the developers that I work with, uh, he, a lot of these things I showed him, he just, just yeah, how could you do this, there's so much bloat. But uh, I hope, after, after you guys see this, uh, you'll see that it's not unnecessary bloat. It really is the bare minimum that you probably add anyways. So, in the last part, this is, these are requirements, but something I look for in the theme is uh, task automation. And I'll show you a little bit about what, what that looks like. Uh, but you know, some of these themes come with, uh, instead of just CSS, they have less than staff support, which makes it easier as a developer to work as part of the team when my CSS files are broken up into smaller, less files, for example. And there's less, less chance for stepping into those toes, and they know exactly where things are supposed to go. Versus traditionally, when you hand off a project to another developer, first place they put their styles is at the end of the style sheet. Not necessarily where it needs to be. So uh, hopefully, you know, some of this stuff is helpful. And, what I'd like to do is kind of breeze through this, show you guys some examples, and open it up. I'm sure uh, you, might, you might, even, might not even call it starter frameworks, but I'm sure you're using something that has helped you in your development process, and I kind of want to open it up and talk about the things that we do look for in a starter theme, and what is unnecessary versus what's necessary, what's missing, what's better, and all that stuff. All right? So, first one, and this is probably uh, the most popular, uh, it's underscores. It's actually one of the one of the cooler things about underscores is it. it from what I remember, I had used it for a long time. It gets its name from the ability to do a search and replace on the files to easily make it your own and basically change the namespace. So if I felt, if I downloaded a theme and it was called uh, and everything every function in the theme was theme underscore something that could potentially conflict with something in the future. Uh, this way, it's, it's, it basically created a GUI where you can go in and uh, create your own. So what this does, on top of giving you an overview of what it is, is I go and put my theme name, and what it's gonna do is it's gonna name the theme that it's also going to go through all the files and replace the underscore with awesome WP. So now all of my theme functions, all of my documentation, and all that is now referencing my theme name I just put in there. And you'll see it already called it awesome WP down here. So I'm just going to open some blind text and we'll take a quick look. We'll do this for all the themes I'm going to talk about just to get an idea of the file structure, what actually comes with the theme. Um, but I kept the original name here. Uh, this, wow. Yeah, you guys can really do that? that. No, it's not. All right. In that style. <laughs> yeah, it works for me, but not necessarily for you guys. It's a dark theme. 
Yeah. Uh, not better. <laughs> Alright, that's a little better. Alright. I still want you guys to see the sidebar though, too. Not cool. Alright, let's try one more thing. Um, So the theme is in an actual a separate file, but it seems like it's going to be bigger and it all work. Actually, I don't even think we need some long text for this. I can just show you guys in here. Sorry about that. Alright, there's a lot to do. So, uh, just to get an idea of what underscores actually comes with, it gives you all of your basic theme templates that you would need to make a complete site. Uh, and it comes with a little extras, uh, a couple extra files here, really still bare minimum, but basic Jetpack integration to turn on Infinite Scroll. Uh, a couple extras in here to do things like get access to an author globals on, a global variable on author profile pages so you can more easily display author information. Um, adding extra classes to the body class, uh, or to the, to the body uh, HTML. Uh, and I think pretty, it has a home uh, class to the, your navigation. So it's small things that you might not think about up front, but when you're actually developing out, just use a little bit of extra stuff to make it easier. Um, personally, I've never used underscores. Anyone here actually use underscores? A oh, couple. So I've, I looked at underscores, I actually wanted a bit more out of it. Um, it really is the, the bare minimum that you need to get to get started. One of the things that is kind of cool about it is in the style that CSS file, it's just a well structured, although not responsive, um, that's up to you. Uh, but just well structured uh, CSS and it actually breaks out all the little pieces that you might forget about. This is specifically important when it comes to content formatting. Uh, so if you're building on a blog, for example, I find unless uh, I've set up really good sample blog posts to make sure I'm really testing for everything, like my blog posts, my images, my image captions, gallery. All that stuff is in here so you just don't forget about it. Uh, and it's really the bare minimum. So, underscores is probably the, it's probably one of the more popular ones. Um, there are a lot of cool frameworks based off of that. And all the frameworks I'm going to show you after this kind of take it a couple steps further. Uh, any questions about underscores? Cool. We get some fun ones. Yeah, question. You said it's not responsive, but it has that Bootstrap folder, Bootstrap WP folder I saw. No, so that's a. These are all other themes right here. Some sort of. Yeah. So the, the under this right here, I think it's in this underscore s. Uh, so back to this. This is. Ooh, this is pretty much what you get. And there, there's no extra style sheet yet besides that one. I'm pretty sure there's one in the ink, but for, uh, I thought there was some, another one in there for layouts. Yeah, for sidebars. That's pretty much it. Yep. So the uh, full name you've given an underscore S, you just chose that, or is it forced you to do that? I actually, I purposely did that so I remember when I was going through here, but that could be whatever I named it when I was using that visual uh, you know, generator. So back to my not so important slides. Uh, so I guess the logical progression. Uh, so basically, the way I chose these I, was just the kind of most mentioned, the most talked about frameworks. And uh, at the end, you can kind of see a little preview of that giant list. We'll get to that later. But Quark was mentioned a lot. I, I think Quark goes a little bit too far in the you know there's a little bit more than I wanted it to, but. It's based off of underscores and the 2012 theme. So you actually, this one is responsive, but you get all the little small things that underscore is built in to kind of make your life a little bit easier. Um, a couple other features I would grab from the site, uh, you know, it comes along a little bit normalized and modernizer, uh, you know, rep font sizing, which I've been really into over, over EMs personally. And then 
Uh, I haven't used the options framework. Has anyone here actually used the options framework? By Devin Price, I ran across it a couple times, but I never done anything with it. But it comes bundled with that, and the font awesome. And I think those two specifically you can turn off, that's why I put it under bundled with. And I like that in, in these, uh, these frameworks, just because it's not forcing it on you, it kind of logically puts it in a place to, if you want to use it, just include this file that comes with it, otherwise, just uncomment and ignore the file. Which is a lot easier than going through a giant functions.php file, which comes with like 2013 or something like that, and picking and choosing the functionality you want that way. So, I'm actually gonna skip past this one unless anyone has any specific questions about Quark. Um, like 2012 is popular, popular enough where you can have a basic understanding of what you're getting with it. But from, I don't believe this is mobile first responsive. I think it's, uh, is there no 2012 is mobile first responsive? Okay. It's just, it is mobile first responsive? All right, it's so. All right, so the difference between responsive and mobile first responsive is responsive you, it, it almost, it, well, from a developer standpoint, it almost seems like an afterthought. Because if you build a website and you're de for a desktop, and then you go and you start optimizing for a tablet and mobile and smaller devices. So your mobile device is still loading all the styles from the desktop version, but then it's adding new styles on top of it for your mobile device. Which seems kind of the opposite of what you should be doing. So a mobile first responsive site does the opposite. You, your base styles are for your mobile, the mobile version of your site. And then from there you introduce uh, the next level up your tablet and then your, your desktop version. And the, the CSS ends up being a lot, a lot more lean. It was weird, it's weird the first couple times you do it, but when it becomes habit, it just becomes a lot easier. And I found some of these frameworks are being there really, really easy for me. Um, so yeah, once again, I'm not sure, I know 2012 is responsive, but I'm not sure it's mobile first responsive. Definitely is? All right. Um, so definitely something to, to look into when you're thinking about responsive in general. Is does it take that mobile first responsive approach? Uh, and there are other things that go along with it, but that's the, kind of the core thing I look for. So uh, another popular framework in general, uh, or CSS framework, is Bootstrap. Um, Bootstrap is mobile first responsive and comes with a bunch of uh, the base functionality that you need for like tabs and accordions and dropdown menus and it, it just looks slick. And you actually, most of the sites that you visit, mostly as a developer, are built on Bootstrap. You'll recognize those big blue buttons. Um, I, I personally, I, I don't use, I don't use Bootstrap maybe once because of those big blue buttons. I don't know why they turned me off for some reason. But uh, it, it is a very powerful, robust framework. A lot of people use it. And this is basically the, the WordPress port of that. So it, it's put all the styles and everything that you need to make Bootstrap one run like you normally would, uh, but in a WordPress theme with your basic template files so that you can start focusing on creating your templates themselves. So a quick look at Bootstrap WP. Uh, a lot like underscores uh, as far as structure. Most of them are gonna look something, something like this. They're gonna have all the basics. Some will have things like you know screenshot just to, to remind you. Uh, as, as kind of a finishing touch when I'm handing out a website to a client, like take a snapshot of the final product and use that as a screenshot, just look professional, and then they can see in the appearance and the themes, like this is their site, there's no question. Um, and a few other small things, like it reminds you to take to create a 404 page, uh, something that is very often overlooked, uh, unless you use the theme or you know to add it in yourself. Um, and most of these themes have very uh, productive 404 pages, adding things like search, um, and categories and that kind of stuff. So it's a good template to, to go off of. Uh, yeah, the, the rest of that's gonna be kind of specific to Bootstrap. Um, if you don't know a lot about Bootstrap, uh, just check it out. That's one of two of the, the kind of the choice frameworks that outside of WordPress that I'd recommend. Um, the other one I'm gonna get to in a minute. And then we'll, we'll dig into a little bit about, a little bit of my uh, process working with uh, the themes. So Roots is one of the first ones I'm really excited to share with you guys. Uh, these last three are my personal favorite, and not necessarily the, the most popular. So Roots is based on HTML5 boilerplate. Um, 
a lot, a lot of developers when they're when they're just trying to create the framework outside of WordPress. If you um, send me a microsite, uh, additional five will fix easy place to go and get that set up. It has a really cool generator where you can go in and put in your basic requirements and it spits out a good framework to start with. So this is this has HTML5 boilerplate kind of out of the box, just kind of the basic functionality you need to make it look good and, and, and function properly in the HTML5 world. Uh, but it adds in some basic accessibility and uh, structured data to uh, the appropriate elements that you want to add that to. So adding like rel author tags and stuff like that to different parts of the theme. Uh, just more as a reminder to, to keep that going. That's something I try to do on all of my sites. Uh, if you aren't using structured data, check out RDFA Lite. Uh, so, and schema.org is the popular version of that. RDFA Lite is the, still works, but probably more forward-thinking version of that. But definitely start using structured data uh, in your in your HTML if you can. And then, so I, I've been working with Less and Sass for a little while now. I have the rest of my team using it too. But the problem I, I found was create using this in a way that everyone was basically on the same page. We're all creating the same, uh, generating the same style sheets, and we're all generating the same uh, JavaScript files from our source files. And one thing that's helped a lot with that is Grunt. Um, so Root uh, comes bundled with Grunt out of the box, which is kind of nice. Uh, also comes bundled with Bootstrap. You can easily disable that. But I just want to show you guys the Grunt functionality quickly. Um, I don't want to dive too much into this, because it could be its own separate talk, honestly. But the way Grunt essentially works, I started creating I haven't looked at the roots Grunt files, so I'm going to kind of wing it and try to walk you guys through it quickly. But the way it works is it's, it's based on Node.js. You have Node installed on your server, and you basically create this Grunt file after you enable the Grunt uh, command line. And this Grunt file basically automates tasks that normally you could just run manually over command line, or that you're running as a desktop app that are monitoring your files and changing things in the background. This does that kind of automatically, pretty easily. So, for example, it looks like this one automatically compiles my less files into CSS. It automatically uglifies. So basically, it takes my JavaScript, removes all the spaces, and uh, shortens all the variable names and stuff to make it really compact uh, so it loads faster. Uh, it looks like it adds basic versioning information to the files. And in this watch right here, actually, you can type in, I'll show you in a second how this works. You can have it constantly watching for changes. So if I if it didn't watch, I can start editing my, my less files and my JavaScript files. And as I'm making the changes, it would automatically compile and create these new files that use actual CSS and actual JavaScript files. And it has live reload in there, too. So if I have the browser plugin in Google Chrome, it would automatically reload uh, in my browser. So then I'm just, I have two windows, I have one where I'm developing and one where I'm looking, and I just I focus on developing, and I just look over and so I'll make sure what's happening is what I want to happen. Um, and just to kind of show you guys quickly, uh, to run Grunt really easily, literally I can look at this Grunt file, but I'm showing the default Grunt command. Um, and what it's doing, it, it'll give me a, an itemized list of the tasks that it's processing as it's doing it. Uh, the only thing with Grunt, be kind of slow, I haven't explored Gulp yet. Is anyone here trying Gulp? It's like the new thing. Everyone's talking about it. I just got into Grunt, so I'll eventually get there. So, yeah, you see here, uh, top part right here, it created my, uh, first it cleaned out my working directory, so the directory that my final files are going to be put in. Then it actually compiled my less files. You guys don't know, don't know what less than SAS is, are basically uh, a shorthand of writing CSS that, when compiled, creates CSS. So you don't have to actually create CSS from scratch. You can, break, you can basically create um, a more easily readable and broken out version of your CSS that's in separate files. And then when you run this process, it concatenates it all and turns it into actual CSS in one file. And so the, having multiple files makes it a lot easier for other developers to jump in and actually help me out without always stepping on my toes. And like I said before, because they're both all logically organized, People aren't just adding to the end of the CSS file. They're loading the correct lot less file, whether it's a mobile first responsive site, and they need to change the large version, and they go into my large.less, and they can find what they're looking for in there. And just to really uh, get the point across, I want to show you guys, um, let's see, what, what it kind of looks like. Like I said, I haven't looked at this before, so I don't know exactly what I'm 
getting myself into here. Terrible example. All right, I'll try this one instead. Give me ahead of myself, but I'll go back and explain. So this is kind of a sample less file. Um, just nicely structured. You can nest your CSS, and then it automatically creates the, the, the you know the, the proper um, scope for the different files you're editing. It makes it a lot easier to read and a lot easier for another developer to come in and actually start adding to it. And using a standardized run file that everyone has access to makes it a lot easier for us to all generate the same quality code all the time without one person's less uh, program doing it one way, it's a little bit different, mine is another way, it's a little bit different. And when you're uglifying it, there's different ways you could actually go and strip down and minify the JavaScript. Now I know we're all doing it the same way. Not that it's a huge deal, but it just standardizes the process. So we're all, we all have the same final product. Another thing I was talking about before is you, you would type in something like rook watch in the press enter, and then what it would do is it would basically watch the files that I told it to watch for any changes. And as I make those changes, it would automatically compile them for me, so I don't have to constantly do it. It's kind of a handy thing to have, especially baked into a theme. So, roots, definitely one of my top recommendations. Yeah? So, is everyone on your team using the same grunt file when they compile the theme? Yeah, so in my, it, we use, use GitHub for our um, yeah. version and everything, so we have our run file in there, and the only thing we make sure it's blue because it automatically creates it is this node, uh, node modules. So if I go back to <coughs> opening condition, so if I go back to the roots, now that I've run npm install, which tells it to go through its in, uh, downloadable packages, it's created this node underscore modules folder. It has a lot of stuff you don't want to put up in the GitHub repo. It's just a really, really big folder. So that's the only thing that we exclude. And then just a new person on the team just has to make sure they put do npm install first. Then they can start running run. Um, we also, I'm not going to cover it in this talk, but to help streamline our development process, let's see if I can find an example in here. Um, we use Mark Aquist's method of using local config files, which makes it a lot easier. I'm going to try and find one so I can show you guys. Uh, yeah, so what basically what we do there is in the WP config, uh, I'm not going to this is actually a live site, but in the WP config, we actually have a test to see if local dash config exists. If it does exist, it uses that for the database instead. If it doesn't exist, it falls, falls back to its own. That way we can have our WP config in Git. And that we have that we use that for auto deploy to our main servers. In our local environments, all you do is create a local dash config.php, and now we can connect our own separate databases without touching that parent WP config. And you can do additional things like uh, you know, turning debug uh, um, constants on and off in your local config that don't affect the parent one. So between that and using run um, in a lot of these uh, boilerplate type frameworks, has helped us a lot as far as streamlining development in general, making it easier for other developers to come in and work with us. So, um, Bones. So, Bones is the first, uh, mobile first startup team that I ever actually played with outside of 2012. Um, it also has less capabilities. I like, uh, the developer told me uh, on his, the download page, is like, if you don't, don't use less, well, top, use it, learn it. And I was like, fine, I'll do it. And so now I love it. And I, I could never go back. And I'm trying to get everyone else on my team to love it just as much. Uh, but Bones is it, it's, it's pretty simple. It does come with a little bit extra, which uh, maybe more than some of the other ones as far as the extra little pieces that you may or may not need. But I'll show you guys a, a simple site that I made on it afterwards. But just a quick look at this. Honestly, I don't think it comes up, it doesn't come with too much else. I think it's pretty logically organized. It's a great starter theme. This was what my uh, developer friend I worked with was complaining about. He thought that was too much. He was like, well, that can be your functions.php file anyway. So this is just a, a standard way of organizing your functions.php file. And I don't mind it as much. You could break this up into smaller files if you really wanted to. Um, but I love it. And like I said, the mobile, Mobile first responsive, 
I'll show you guys a sample site that we made using it. So this site's using it. Um, this was a small build for a client. They didn't even want, he didn't ask for it to be responsive. We just did it for him, and he had heard about it, came back to us, said, hey, can you make responsive? Well, we did. So uh, <laughs> that was a, a bonus for us. Um, <coughs> but oh, we, we won this guy to like us. He's, gotten, he's given us more business sense, so it, it all worked out. But uh, yeah, and, and it was it, basically less. Made it very easy for us to compose this, this experience, which uh, would have been a lot harder to do otherwise. So I think this is working. So this actually this is actually basically a, like a basic parallax experience or scrollware and patient paper parallax. Um, that we built for the client as, as well, all using less, using the, the base styles that they gave us, had to keep it very stripped down in the middle. Um, and we were actually, because a lot of this is using some CSS3 functionality that kind of makes it a little bit harder to keep on top of all those browser prefixes you gotta keep track of. So Grunt has an auto prefixer uh, a task that you can ask for. So as part of my grunt file, one of the things it would do is it would go through my, my CSS and would find any uh, CSS styles that needed their need prefix, what the proper prefix is. And it connects to a database that's constantly checking to see when browsers adopt the actual functionality. So if you don't know, the way it works, W3C sets basic standards, so it's the browsers to implement them according to the way the W3C recommends. Not everybody does that, the way they recommend, not everybody does it at the same time. So some browsers are doing things based on the W3C spec that other browsers haven't caught up yet, or are doing a little bit differently. So to solve that in the meantime, while these standards are being built out and solidified, the browsers that do embrace it, embrace it using browser prefixes, saying this is the way I'm gonna do it, it'll work the way you think it will, but it might change in the future. So what now a prefix are allowed me to do is not worry about keeping track of who's supporting what. I can just write my styles, focusing on the styles I know, with the type functionality I know, and let the prefixer go in and add the dash mod dash, the dash o dash, the dash, the dash web get dash. And if you look at a style sheet, you'll see a lot of that. So uh, that specifically for this uh, was incredibly helpful, because this would have been a huge pain in the ass otherwise. And this, this experience went through, the, the, parallel, the scroll around animation experience, went through four different developers. Uh, and everyone was able to jump in pretty easily. It was one of the developers' first time even looking at less, and I think less is a very logical uh, thing, so he was able to dive right in and help uh, finish producing this. So that was great. What is the scrolling tool that you're using? The scroller? Yep. Super. Super scroller. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, I, I've done a couple of parallax sites now. Uh, one line in jQuery. This one I like because it's super scroll around and it uses tween max, like, which is, or no, which is green, green sock, yeah. Um, it's, it's the flash animation stuff for it over JavaScript. It's actually a lot faster than jQuery anime. So if you don't want to use jQuery, that is an awesome alternative to green sock animations. Um, the best, I think, being uh, CSS transitions. I keep doing something different every day. Um, but yeah, so this one we use that. And uh, the last one we did, we just did uh, completely custom because we wanted to try it. Uh, we, we wanted to see how good we, how good we were with style manipulation without jQuery. You kind of get comfortable with jQuery. So that, that was a fun one. Uh, Super scroll Rama? Oh, this? No. So what we did is uh, once you get below a certain uh, breakpoint, it just locks all the images in place so you can still scroll through and see some animations, but you don't get that parallax experience. So we make sure it still works, but doesn't work with the same in caliber. But it works pretty fast too, so I'm glad we can go with jQuery. So my most recent uh, favorite framework in general is Foundation. Uh, is anyone here use Foundation for? Yeah. All right. Cool. Foundation is just, Zurb in general, it is just like a, it's like a cool company. And I, 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 get, I get sucked into their website. I don't work with these guys, they're cool. I love my job, so I'm gonna stay here and do that thing. It's 
feel their stuff like it. So uh, foundation on top of just being a badass framework. Um, this guy, I, there are a couple good ports of foundation over to WordPress, um, but my favorite is, is joints. Uh, it goes along the theme of skeleton, bones, joints. Unfortunately, I think he chose joints because he's a pothead, not because he thinks it falls at pain. Um, but uh, it's basically just a, a really stripped down, nice uh, framework. Uh, well commented, modern HTML5 templates, and it uses SAS, a lot like less. Um, if you use less, you can use SAS. Um, and I, uh, I create my own grunt file for my, so it doesn't come with grunt, but grunt's kind of my weapon of choice for the time being. Uh, before that, I was using some, some, some desktop apps to automatically compile all the stuff. But just a basic grunt file that goes and uh, up, navigates up to my theme directory and actually compiles the SAS files and amplifies my JS. And I like using JS hint as well, so I'm just my JavaScript. Uh, I can it, it basically make sure that it's clean. Uh, I don't know if you guys read the JavaScript the good parts. You know, a lot of those standards are kind of you know brought over to JS hint. So I like to, to use that to kind of boilerplate to make sure that I'm writing just good clean JavaScript. Um, so all that's baked into my grunt file here. This is the grunt file I actually use on my live website, uh, which is not much. I'm not much of a designer, but uh, this is another site I built in a day uh, using foundation. Mm, nothing too crazy in here, but what I'm going to show you guys a couple things why I think it is really cool. But so mobile first responsive, and I was never a grid person. I never liked uh, just CSS grids in general. I feel like they're kind of pigeonholing me into like, like a certain type of style, and my, the creative the creative would have to match a certain look and feel for it to work properly. And I wanted more control of my breakpoints in mobile. And I think I was being stubborn, honestly. Uh, framework or foundation converted me. I am now a huge fan of of most uh, CSS frameworks. One of the things I liked about uh, this one specifically is just the way it's organized. It's probably easier to just do a source rather than try and uh, show you guys. And actually, let's go here. And the way it works is in in your theme. This is a foundation thing. This is nothing specific to WordPress. But let's go into my note blog. What you do is you tell it the number of columns that you want it to use and the size in which to use it. So I could write, I don't have to play a bad example, but. Just go to the, go to the foundation website. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. That was the next step. <laughs> so even better, actually. So one of the things I'm trying to actually convince my user experience team to do is start prototyping in foundation. Um, one of the, they're still using old tools, like, well, export HTML, so I'm never gonna use that. Like they just don't—they don't get it. Like, well, it's, it's HTML. Like that's what you build it in, right? It's like, not like that. So, this this kind of enforces just a, a logical structure of not only the HTML, but just the way you the way it becomes responsive. So, this example. I'm trying to see what it does first. And I did. So the way, the way it works is for every content area, you tell it how to act at different resolutions, large, medium, and small. So in large, I can say it would be 12 columns, but once I get into small view, make it four columns. It would probably be the reverse. You have large, it's four columns, and then small, it's 12 columns. <coughs> Basically, you're telling it, at one point, it's going to be in the top corner. Once I get to mobile, they take the full width. You know, it's mobile, now it's the full width. It makes it really easy to get that granular control over content areas and decide exactly what the breakpoints do. And it takes it a step further. And you can hide certain content areas and introduce new content areas on mobile. So I uh, think, yeah, actually on my site, I do that. So this top area right here um, is set to only display uh, this large, so this is right here. And then I have this hide for small. Basically, that's just an image of what my header would be. But Oh, sorry, sorry, it's reverse. Okay, yeah. 
So basically what I'm telling you here is to hide the main uh, header area on a small screen, but show this smaller uh, image on a, on a mobile screen. So basically it's just swapping out my header with uh, just an image of what my header would look like so that my user, the user doesn't have to wait for this giant background image, which is my header, to load. So it gives you that kind of granular control over different breakpoints. That's a foundation thing, like I said, not a WordPress thing. But foundation in general is just one of my, my favorite things to work with. It comes with a lot of the things that, um, that Bootstrap comes with, as far as you know, accordions, navigation, and that kind of stuff, sticky navs. Uh, and even my site, what I did, I went to the foundation website, and then they have this templates, and every, each one of these you can preview first. So say, this is a new one, feed. I want to create a, a Twitter clone. So now I have a starter HTML that I can copy and paste into my theme and go up from there. And I would normally, normally do that, but if you're looking for, if you do want to start from scratch, it is kind of a nice extra step to become familiar with their, uh, their grid system. Yep. I'm just curious because I've used that bootstrap in the past. I've actually never used the foundation where it's not WordPress stuff, but what, what do you like better about foundation? Because I've really never actually well, like I said, I, I have zero experience with bootstrap. I just don't like their blue button. That's literally okay. it's a terrible reason, but that's like I don't go around saying that to people, but if I'm being honest, but like that's I never got into it because their their styles I feel like were overly opinionated. Versus foundation, I felt like it was everything Bootstrap did just a little bit less, so I had a little bit more control. That's really all it was. And I might not be, if that might be correct, I could be, I could be a brain or something. <laughs> so, uh, last couple things, last thing we'll join before I move on and wrap this up. Uh, it comes with a couple extra things. So. And this is what it just totally sold me. Small things that I would do to the, the admin uh, interface to kind of customize it for a client, like replace the logo on the login screen, just small things. And it has that all baked into a nice little, uh, a nice little template file that you can just comment out. And I use it on my site, but I haven't used it on any, any client sites yet, which doesn't make any sense. Um, Basically, comes with a couple extra files that you can just go in and comment out if you don't need them. So if you don't want to use their, uh, you don't want to use these extra admin styles, you don't need them. If you don't want to use his file that implies or shows the basic structure for a custom post that you don't need that. You can just use the base foundation functionality, so you don't get the extra bloat that other workers are going to usually come with. Taking anything away from this, reserve the foundation. Even the reserve website. Pattern tap, uh, the random things that they have on that site are just amazing. Quips, Quips is just a dead database of uh, little facts to help support. Uh, so I remember in SLW now, you can jump back and say, hey, here's some stats on mobile 2014. It has like a list of just little facts that you can throw in their sources. And pattern tap, from a UX standpoint, just a sample uh, design patterns. And it's just an easy way to see like, what people are doing, how they're doing it, what it's called, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, triggers is the other one too that sort of has really cool. So, there are a lot more I could have talked about. These are, <laughs> this is the list uh, that I ran across while I was looking around. Um, I have used Skeleton before. Uh, it's just, it's not mobile first, so that's why I went over to Bones. Um, used Toolbox a while back, I wasn't a huge fan, but that's just me. Starkers is very popular. Um, Simon was pretty popular, although I couldn't figure out why. I don't just sign in. Cool, so I wasn't missing anything. Uh, thematic is very popular, you'll see that around. Foundation is popular, hybrid base. Hybrid is one of my kind of first favorite themes in general that I liked. I liked what we did with page templates, uh, so that was a great one. Um, uh, yeah, pretty much it. I don't have a closing slide. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's one called? Shoe strap? Based on 
Interesting. No, I haven't run across that one. Supposedly based on boots. Shoe strap? Yeah. No, I haven't heard it before. Uh, there's tons and tons out there. Yeah. It's a joint, joint stocking team. Mobile first? Yep. I'm pretty sure in, in the description he's like, why joints? Well, they both, they both love joints. That was his reasoning. Uh, any other, what frameworks, are you guys using anything I may, might not have mentioned? Uh, do some people here, pref who here like prefers to start from scratch? Who just likes to have control? Nothing wrong with that. I did it for a long time. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's nice. I mean, especially when you get to the point where you know all the game function on the top of your head. And I mean, honestly, a lot of this stuff, I think I like it more for just like the front integration, the less integration, and the, the framework, the foundation, and that kind of stuff. And the fact that it is different. Yeah. So, <coughs> that's just me. Anything that you guys thought shouldn't be on this list? What? Okay, that's all of this. So, one thing you guys talked about, John, is what the support levels are, right? For example, Foundation 5, which I love, we use a lot of time. But if you do something that I hate, you can't use, you can't use Foundation 5. Use Foundation 4, right? So, different I frameworks have different. mention, uh, one of the things that drew me towards Foundation originally was it, 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 it's, it's built more as a rapid prototyping tool. It, it's, it's, it's built in a way that makes it easy to create the, that base functionality, kind of basically replaces wireframe. It's a, it's a little mini functional website without styles. So that was one of the things that initially drew me to it. Okay. The other thing you probably want to talk about is, this, I know that these come with plugins, like Foundation comes with a bunch of good JavaScript plugins already ready to go. So you need carousel, you need Quantum images, you need form yeah. validation, you need that kind of, that's already in there, right? Yeah, you know, so you're the one who just has to mix and match jQuery plugins, different stuff, right? So Bootstrap comes with a bunch of plugins already ready to go, foundation comes with that. Some of them own, are only CSS only, right? They don't come yeah. with any JavaScript plugins. So again, what functionality do you need, or do you just want to just get the, the base framework going, and you already have other plugins that you already want to use? But if you don't, Foundation, um, when you're actually creating, like if you're not using WordPress, you can go in and choose all like the actual pieces, like you mentioned, the, the different like coordinate navigation, even the grid itself. You can you can download Foundation without any of that. Uh, so you can really customize and make it your own. Uh, with Joins WP, it comes with all that stuff. However, it's not too hard to turn off um, if you know where to look, which I. Basically, uh, yeah, right here, you can just remove items from this and you can basically compile your own custom version of Foundation that doesn't have a lot of the extra uh, bloat that, that would come with Foundation. You just downloaded it from scratch out of the box. So, uh, it really does depend on the type of project you're using. You know, keep in mind, look, look for that bloat. Like how much is it actually added? You know, from a, you know, JavaScript and CSS and all that stuff, and even extra functions. 
feel like that's that's usually the biggest culprit. Uh, it's just the these giant functions that PHP files and new ways of overwriting and adding templates and kind of unnecessary things that are mostly built into WordPress or you just don't need. So like be conscious of that when you're looking at these frameworks too. And starting from scratch is not a bad thing. You know, you're not, you're not losing a lot. Uh, I'll, my goal is to actually create, uh, not using foundation, but my perfect burn file, my perfect base start thing that I can use that works for me. It's gonna be different for everybody based on your workflow, the, the, the type of tools that you like to use, um, and we're gonna be using it. I'm doing a lot less WordPress development these days. I'm doing just a lot of standalone microsites, or even other, like E, and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, for all of those, it, it's the same. So, yeah, any other questions about uh, these frameworks, or uh, anything that you guys are using that I haven't mentioned? Awesome, so yeah, uh, let's wrap it up. So we only have a thousand dollars shorter, sorry. We have 20 minutes left. Um, <laughs> There are a couple of cold slices of pizza if you if you want them. Uh, once again, my name is John Bishop. You can check out my website, johnbishop.com. Come work with me. I <laughs> really need. Uh, we're, we're really looking for uh, developers to help us out with some stuff. So full time, if you're interested, come talk to me. That'd be awesome. But yeah, thanks. <laughs>